Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the uh, committee. I'm very pleased to be invited today to talk about GAO's high-risk list update. Uh, we do this update, as noted, every two years with the beginning of each new Congress in order, in order to identify areas that we believe are at highest risk of waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement, or are in need of broad-based reform. Uh, I'm very pleased to report, with this committee's help, and I appreciate their, your support, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cummings, and committee members of oversight since our last report in 2011, that notable progress has been made in the vast majority of areas on the high-risk list. Uh, this has been due, in part, to legislation passed by the Congress. For example, the FDA uh, Authorization Act addressed many issues that GAO had recommended for improvements uh, to oversight of medical products and devices, for example, uh, uh, dealing with drug shortages uh, and also increased inspections, risk-based in foreign operations. Uh, Congress also passed important legislation concerning the flood insurance program, which is also on our list. Also, OMB and the agencies have been holding regular meetings with GAO which I uh, personally participate in, in order to focus on solutions and, and to identify ways to make the necessary improvements to get off of the list. Uh, this year, enough progress has been made that we're removing two items from the list. Uh, first is interagency contracts. Interagency contracts can ask, actually be a very good and important management tool if done properly. We found uh, back in 2005 they were not done very well. They were out of scope. Uh, in terms of the contracts, lack of competition. One of the most notable examples was the hiring of interrogators for Iraq using an IT contract. Uh, since then, important procedures have been put in place. Agencies have fixed the problems. The Congress has required the federal acquisition regulations to be reformed for best procurement decisions uh, and also requiring a business case before new interagency contracts are put in place and better data now is being collected in those areas. So we believe uh, that there are adequate mechanisms in place in order to help manage this very important tool to help the government uh, leverage its buying power. Secondly, uh, we're removing the IRS business system modernization from the list. It was originally put on in 1995 due to the IRS being mired uh, with management and technical problems with their modernization effort. They've made steady progress over the years. They've just deployed the first module of the system, which allowed us now daily updating of taxpayer accounts, uh, which will improve taxpayer service and also their enforcement uh, activities as well. We've reviewed their investment management practices and found about 80 percent of them meet uh, best practices, and all of their project management recommendations uh, do that. Their software development uh, uh, component now has been rated at a computer maturity model level three under the Software Engineering Institute standards, which means it's a very, that's a good level by industry standards. Uh, two important points I'd make with these areas we're taking off the list. One, uh, we continue to monitor those areas after they're off the list. So they may be off the list, but they're not about out of sight. Uh, and so we make sure that the progress that's been gained is enduring. Uh, secondly, uh, like the other areas that eventually come off the list, they come off because of two major reasons. One is sustained congressional oversight. And oversight and the interagency contracting, Congress uh, insisted on important reforms, required the IGs to do uh, continual reviews in this area. In the IRS area, Congress required an annual expenditure plan from IRS every year and a GAO review. And so, uh, continued congressional oversight can pay enormous dividends in resolving many of these problems. The two new areas we're adding this year, uh, one is limiting the federal government's fiscal exposure by better managing climate change risk. Uh, it's clear the number of uh, disasters have gone from, in 2004, to the federal government intervening in 65 to 98 in 2012, which is a record number of years. Uh, there's indications that the severe weather events, uh, both by the National Academy of Sciences and by the government's global change uh, management research program, that there'll be more events occurring and more costly events. 
Uh, the federal government has enormous exposure to these risks. First, uh, it's one of the largest property holders in the government, or in the nation. There are hundreds of thousands of buildings uh, and, that the federal government owns, and also defense installations uh, along our coastlines. Uh, also, the federal government holds 29 percent of the property uh, in uh, the, the United States and manages that property. Also manages the flood and crop insurance programs, which we've recommended take into account uh, climate science issues in revamping those programs. We found that, the, and the government is also the provider of disaster aid, over $80 billion over the past year and before the assistance for Hurricane Sandy. We found that the uh, criteria for the federal government intervening in a disaster is an artificially low level. It's based on $1.36 per person per state. So any uh, disaster that exceeds that threshold gets federal assistance, and it had not been adjusted for inflation for a 13-year period of time. Had it been adjusted for inflation, the federal government would have uh, intervened in 25 percent less uh, situations in terms of the federal government deciding to, to get involved. Uh, the, we've recommended that the federal government needs a better strategic plan for this area that sets priorities to guide investments decisions. Individual agencies have plans, but there's no overall central direction uh, and uh, 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 priorities that are set for that area and coordinate at the federal level or with the state and local government. I know, Mr. Chairman, you made that point this morning. That's in our report. It's very important that the federal government provide technical information on weather-related issues to state and local governments to guide their investment decisions in huge amounts of infrastructure. Uh, the federal uh, flood insurance programs and the crop insurance programs need to be reformed, and we need to set better criteria uh, that takes into account the federal government's fiscal condition right now. The last area we added uh, on the list is gaps in weather satellite information uh, due to management problems and acquisition problems over the years. Right now, the gaps in the polar orbiting satellites that provide early midday and afternoon warnings uh, to feed uh, computer weather prediction models uh, and uh, to provide the three, four, and seven-day forecast has a potential for a gap to occur as early as 2014 and could last up to 53 months. This is very important. Uh, without that information, you know, one credible organization has said that the information from the polar orbiting satellites, the prediction of the path for Superstorm Sandy would have shown it going out to sea and not hitting New Jersey at all. And so without this critical information, uh, there are property, lives, economic consequences, and so we're adding this area to our high risk list. We've at our recommendation, contingency plans have been developed, uh, but they need to be executed, monitored properly, and I think congressional oversight could be very beneficial and necessary in this area. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my broad overview of the major changes on the list. Uh, there are 30 items now remaining on the list, and I'd be happy to answer questions.